Hey, it's Steve with Crosby's Vineyards. I'm the winemaker here, and uh, this is our Friday wine tasting. Uh, we're really excited this week for our verticals of Cap Franc. Uh, and it's kind of a nice uh, primer for me because this time of year we're about to start cracking open all the red barrels uh, from the 2020 vintage and tasting through those. So it's nice to gain some perspective on how the wines age and, and um, you know what we can do with our blending that we're looking forward to this uh, May and then going through June and July. Uh, in the vineyard, we're, uh, I'm sure you guys are all experiencing the same crazy weather that we are, which is definitely provided, proving some challenges for us. So everybody please think some warm thoughts for the next few nights, uh, we could use them. Uh, but we'll be here making sure that we keep the grapes uh, safe and tight and sound, and hopefully uh, we're off to another good vintage. But let's dive right into the tasting, and I hope you guys are ready and excited to uh, enjoy. Uh, so these three wines, the 2009, the 13, and the 17, uh, I picked them just based on taste as I was going through the library to give us a good uh, sense of all the types of vintages and styles that we, we have here at Krosky's. But it's actually kind of interesting that once I picked them out, I went back through the, the vintage notes, and they're all very similar vintages um, in the standpoint of the pick dates were quite similar. Uh, and the harvest numbers uh, all kind of lined up. So I think they're an even ripeness. All of these will be considered a, a good year, a standard year for us here. Uh, so stylistically, they, I think they were all pretty similar when they were younger, uh, except the 2017, which we'll talk about when we get there. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see really what age does to a wine. Um, when I taste these wines, like I said last week, uh, I usually only taste the young wines. That's my, uh, uh, my job, so I'm always tasting wines right before, up, up until the moment they're bottled, and sometimes they kind of get shipped off. So this was interesting and exciting to see kind of those building blocks that we put together and, and how they actually form and, and melt. So uh, there's not really an order here. Uh, we can start with the oldest, but before I even get started, I, I want to give them all uh, a smell and just see, uh, you know, the stage of aging that they're at. And the other thing we look at is color, which is kind of funny because uh, here at Crosby's we, we have lots of color in all the wines. Um, I never really worry about color. We don't do anything in the processing of the wines to try to enhance color. Um, it's just a, a byproduct of our natural you know, premium winemaking style. Uh, but that being said, with time, you do lose a little bit of color. So one good way to tell the age of a wine uh, is, is the color, especially against uh, what that wine looked like when it was younger. And so starting with the 2009, which at this point is becoming quite uh, quite an aged wine, you can see it's definitely a little bit more brick red, uh, not nearly as opaque, and then potentially just a hint of, of that browning along the, the outside edge. Um, if this was a young wine, those would be things that we you know would be very disappointed in and we'd we'd be angry at ourselves that we had this uh, wine that went in the bottle looking this way. But old wines kind of fit into their own category. So this is a natural process that happens with time and it's just showing that it is in fact a 2009. Um, so the aromatics are gonna be different. The flavor is gonna be different. You're gonna have a whole new development, a lot of exciting things uh, on the bouquet and the palate. But uh, the consequence of that aging is also the color. And with the smell, with this one, I it's a completely integrated wine. If I smell that 2009, I can't smell the oak, uh, I can't smell the fruitiness, I can't smell any floral notes to it. Uh, for me, it's a, a single note, uh, a, a complex and deep note, uh, but all of those elements that make up a wine are, are all here together. With the 2013, especially in comparison to the 17, the oak has started to disappear. The oak is really well integrated. And now we're starting to develop uh, secondary aging characteristics that uh, for me and this wine really seem like more floral uh, and a little bit of dried fruit, so almost like a fig or a raisin. And whereas the 2017, the youngest wine, it still to me smells like uh, a fresh cooked fruit, almost like a blackberry cobbler, and I can still pick up the, the cooperage, the oak that was used on the wine. Um, 
in this wine, it doesn't seem to be quite as much of a, uh, like a toasted vanilla or marshmallow or some of those classic oak uh, characteristics that you hear people say. For me, it, it is almost like the fresh hewn wood. Uh, like, you know, when the, it's just a house on the street is getting a new deck and you can kind of get that scent uh, from, from across the street. That is uh, the kind of the oak that we're, we're finding in, in this wine. And in my experience, I always associate that with one of our cooperages we use, Sagun Morale, which uh, adds a nice, uh, interesting complexity to the, to the wine. Uh, but you can see that's been a cooper here for the last 15 years. Uh, it's made up at least 30% of all the new oak in all these wines. So that really becomes more and more integrated and turns more towards floral and that dried fruit note over time. Uh, I'm going to start actually with the 2017. Lots of that ripe fruit, that lush fruit. And it's no spring chicken. It is at this point three years old, so the fruit is starting to get a little bit more of those cooked notes, like I said, blackberry cobbler. The oak is still present, but pleasant, not overpowering. This has, I think, 28% new French oak. The rest of the wine is aged in neutral French barrels. So a lot of that ripe fruit comes through on the palate. Um, the acidity is nice, and, but it accentuates the tannins a lot. So this is definitely a stronger wine that leaves the entire mouth dried uh, and making you want to smack your lips. Uh, that's a good strong tannin. It makes it a great food wine. Uh, this is the type of wine where it can stand up to something that's got some char on it. Uh, some of those more bitter notes that you might find in food, this wine can, can power through. Good length. Um, you can definitely still taste uh, maybe a little bit of heat on the wine. Uh, it's not very alcoholic. Um, it's no more than, I think it's 13.7%, no, 14%. So we're starting to get into that range uh, with that alcohol where you can kind of feel that warming sensation. For me, it doesn't show up on the nose and I don't really taste it, but it is a very warm wine as you drink it. Um, 2017 is kind of when we shifted styles with our new vineyard block. Uh, so we had block two Cabernet Franc, right when you pull in the cross keys on the right hand side. Uh, that block was planted in 2003, so it's very old, uh, but the clones there tend to make a lighter, more savory style of wine, whereas the 2017 has our Block 5 Cap Funk added to the Block 2, uh, which has a different grow orientation. They are younger vines, produced a lot more sugar, hence the higher alcohol percentage, but that alcohol and that ripeness that we got from that other block brought a lot of that, that strong, luscious fruit flavors. So. I would say that this is a wine that has lots of aging potential because of how much tannins it has in it. I think it'll still maintain that uh, that strong mouthfeel, that that good drying character to the tannin for you know at least another five or six years. And so as we move on, we can taste the 2013, which would be the just block two uh, Cabernet Franc and. Here on the nose, I think you get more of that. For me, it's coming off as floral, but when it's younger, Block 2 has some sage, uh, dried um, herb notes to it to complement a lighter fruit. Uh, so usually it's like cherry and sage would be the notes that we, we associate with that vineyard block. Here you can see it's really turned into more floral, um, which is a really nice evolution for that wine. You can compare the color. It's starting to, it's losing a little bit of that purple luster that the 2017 has, but it's still very densely colored, uh, still very, um, you know, it's not showing signs of, of extreme age in the bottle. It's almost a perfume aroma. It's very nice, uh, pleasant. I'm really stuck on the floral for this wine. Acidity is uh, very nice. It's a, very similar to the 2017. 
Uh, it really carries those fruit flavors on the palate, but you really notice here is the textural difference of those tannins. And here it seems like the quantity is still... Quick question yes. for you. Uh, how was the weather in 2017? Was there a lot of rain? Not in 2017. Um, we had, we were cut short a little bit by rain, uh, by, by about a week from what we would ideally want to pick the wines at. But at this point, the Block 5 Cabernet Franc um, was so young. Young vines love to give you sugar. They just want to get really, really ripe, really, really quick. Uh, so even though we weren't quite where we wanted to be with the skin texture on that block, they still had plenty of ripeness. Uh, so it wasn't uh, really detrimental to, to get that hit uh, maybe about a week earlier than we like to pick it now that the block has aged a little bit. Uh, and whereas really the block two has had the same pick date for going on a decade, it really right around September 28th, it says pick me, I'm ready to go, and we do. So uh, it wasn't until I think October 6th or 7th that we started having issues in 2017 with rain, uh, but the cap crop really saw, saw none of that as an issue. Maybe a little bit wet in the spring, but that doesn't really matter for us. If the tap turns off in August, then we're, uh, we can really make the, the ripeness that we're going for. So on the textures of this tannin, I think a lot of this has to do with that age. Um, it's had a little bit of oxygen uh, over time. The oxygen is actually trapped inside of the corks uh, and then slowly releases into the wine at a very hopefully consistent rate. Uh, of course, our natural products, so there's a lot of bottle lot of variation, and that will happen. Uh, you'll see that the differentiation will be much more extreme as the wine ages. Uh, but we do use a high quality cork, so we have a, a, some good consistency, or we, we aim for some consistency on that, that slow oxidation of the wine. And as that oxidizes, really what happens is the tannins will polymerize, and it's just a fancy way for them saying that they get bigger. Uh, the shorter the tannin, the greener uh, the tannin is what we call it. It doesn't necessarily mean green tasting or you know like flavors. Uh, it's just our term for it. They're small and, and rough, so you can think of it a little bit more like sandpaper. Um, if we and then as it ages, they'll start to bind together and start becoming more like you know a river stone or a pebble, something smoother, even though the quantity hasn't uh, necessarily decreased. But the other thing that happens is eventually they get so big that the tannins will fall out of suspension because they're not dissolved in the wine, they're just floating in the wine. Uh, they'll get so big that they'll actually start to set them out. And on these older bottles, you can usually find a little streak of something on the side, and that would be a lot of the tannins that have, have fallen off, out over, over the years. Um, now that said, it still has plenty of tannin, and it seems like we're in a good stage with this wine where those tannins have really just polymerized and made it much more satiny. Uh, it's definitely a, I wouldn't call it silky because they're definitely still present and strong, but they're very, they're much more supple, much more chewy, uh, not quite as drying as you find on the younger wines. So it's still a wine that can pair well with food, but I think you could potentially overpower it. Um, you know, it's not going to really scrape the inside of your mouth clean like a, like a young wine will. And as we taste the older wines, we start getting into the difference between aroma and bouquet. I'm not a sommelier, I'm a winemaker, so I like to talk, always view wine through the lens of how it was made and uh, how I enjoy to drink it, rather than, uh, you know, the, I guess the more technical tasting aspects. Now that said, uh, I really, uh, I, I try to use a, a standard terminology, so with uh, wines, we would typically refer to aroma as the flavors in the nose that come from the actual grape, uh, typically the skins, the seeds, and then with a bouquet, that's more of the aging uh, characteristic. So it starts initially with oak, uh, and then over time, kind of those aged characteristics we get. So more of those floral notes, uh, more of those raisiny notes would be the bouquet. Uh, what is your favorite current vintage so far at Cross Keys, and do you recommend decanting older library wines? Uh, so my favorite current vintage is 2019, 
which is, sorry, the winemaker brings, which is, this is my new year's for winemakers. Uh, we are, tend to be about four months behind. <laughs> so 2020 has just started for us. Uh, but the 2019 was just an absolutely exceptional year. Um, I, there's really nothing else could be said about it. Uh, I can't really imagine having anything better than that. So we really look forward to, to getting those in the bottle uh, in the next few months. Uh, but that said, 2017 was great. Uh, everything was lining up perfectly. Uh, and in fact, you know, sometimes nature makes the decision on picking for us. Um, and you know what, nature seems to have made the right decision, but we're very happy with the wines. There's a chance that we could have held the wines on the, on the vine a little too long and lost some of the acidity that we looked for. So uh, 17 was another great year. 16 was a good year. Um, similar story, a little hotter, so we did have some acid issues, but uh, really not, nothing too bad. Um, and then for decanting, uh, decanting is all just a matter of, of your personal preference. As you decant, essentially what you're doing is introducing oxygen into the wine. So you're doing that same thing where you're calming down the tannins. Um, just like, it's be like aging the wine in a bottle for 10 years, you can get it done in an hour. If you really, you know, put it in a, a good decanter with lots of oxygen uh, available for it. Um, I would say the older, in general, older wines, you don't want to decant because you can really brew some of those more delicate aromatics and there's not a lot of tannin to, left to be oxidized. So you want to be a little careful. But that said, when I did this tasting, I think the 13 could use a gentle short decant uh, to bring the aromatics out. And the 2010 uh, actually has more tannins, which we're not tasting today, but has more tannins than this 13. It still needs a, to be decanted. Uh, for some reason, that wine has really held its tannins beautifully. Uh, but as we get into the 2009, I'd be more tempted to, uh, to be gentle, more gentle on the wine. One, you know, if you're, you're tasting the wine for the wine's sake, um, which I don't really expect anyone to do, we pull wine in a very um, revered position, but let's remember that it is an agricultural product that we're really proud to make for you to drink, you know? You don't have to think too hard about it. Find something you like and drink it. But if you really want to get into the bottle of wine, what I prefer to do is get a big glass, um, <laughs> Drink a big glass, no, but get a, a, a large glass, uh, put in a normal amount of wine, and straight from the bottle, smell it, taste it. Uh, then you swirl it, smell it, taste it. Maybe, you know, hold, put your hand on a bowl. This is my number one pet peeve. This heats up your wine. That said, if you're interested in finding all the little notes that might be in the wine, a slightly cool wine, a cellar temperature wine, pour it into a glass, you taste it, uh, swirl it, you taste it, keep your hand on it, and keep tasting it as it warms up. And you'll find whole different notes uh, from each one of those experiences. So rather than decanting uh, aggressively into a decanter, it might be nice just to kind of see how that wine evolves in the glass. Um, you know, you can control the temperature, like I said, using your hand. So you get a whole different aspect based on the wine temperature. So we can taste the delicate old wine here. Uh, I was surprised how vibrant the wine still is, and I think that has a lot to do with the acidity that we really strive for here on our red wines. Uh, it can be hot here in the summer, so we and we can also be. Uh, let's just say we want to keep the canopy as open as possible for for disease purposes. We love air moving through. Um, it's kind of hard to say right now because we need a we got a lot of work to do in the vineyard this time of year, and it is always windy. Today being uh, quite the uh, exemplification of that fact. It is incredibly windy. Uh, wind makes it tough to do some of our job here, but that wind in general uh, really helps cut down on disease. So we like to take all the leaves off of the bottom of the uh, canopy, specifically on the morning side, so where the sunlight will hit it in the morning because the sun's not quite as intense, and really try to get airflow in there. But it's a fine balancing act of getting that airflow, getting those skins to ripen in the sun, and hang, uh, maintaining the acidity because 2009 is a good exemplification of, um, that's a vocab word for the day. I used a weird word twice in one sentence, but it's a, it, it shows what that acidity can do. It can hold the wine, uh, still tasting youthful and fresh and, and vibrant after 11 years because of the acidity. We don't want it to be so sour that it reminds you of like orange juice or like, you know, strips the enamel off your teeth. Uh, but we, we want to have a strong acidity in that wine to complement the tannins and really help with the, the aging of the wine. So that vibrancy, that ability to age is really dependent on, on acidity.
And this, for me, the aromatics on it are almost all towards that bouquet side. Um, I'm starting to get a lot of that raisin, uh, even a little bit of like dried dill, um, which which is an interesting note. Um, you know, once again, maybe something that I wouldn't be really thrilled with in a young wine, but we can start to appreciate it more, more as that as that wine ages. So I think it's still very pleasant, but at this point, we really don't taste much of the fruit that was in the skins when we picked it. Um, it's starting to really show how it's been aging in a bottle for over a decade. And there's almost like a dry biscuit uh, note on it as well, which is kind of interesting. It's a drying sensation, whereas I think the 13, it's still kind of uh, a moist aroma, if that makes sense. So it's almost like, a, yeah, it'd be like fig versus fruit leather would be my uh, way to put it. It's like a straw, not in, kind of like a, a, a dry bread. And the acidity is still beautiful. The tannins here really just stay on your tongue. It's like pulling over a warm um, blanket over your tongue. It's not at all fine. I don't find it really too much on the sides or the roof of my mouth. Uh, they've really integrated well. They're still present. Uh, it still has bitterness. Eventually the wines will just fall apart entirely. Uh, we don't know exactly when that is for Kowski's wines. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, so <laughs> I say anything you can buy from us still has some aging potential. So uh, that's exciting, um, and I really I don't I, I love that people enjoy old wine, and it's something that I wish I could get into. Like I said, I, I taste the uh, the young ones so much that I'm always kind of focused on that. But this is a good exemplification of what you gain with bottle aging. If you find a red wine that seems too bitter for you, you think that you like the sweeter wines. Sometimes you just want to taste the older wine that has kind of mellowed out a little bit. Uh, the 2013 seems to have the most of that distinct green bell pepper note. Any reason in particular that one shines through the most? Uh, so green bell pepper uh, is, uh, let's see, it's a methoxypyrazine, uh, which is naturally produced by the grape skins. As a def defense, uh, the grapevine doesn't know that it's making wine. It thinks that it's making uh, seeds, and in order to get those seeds spread out, it surrounds it in a, a, a grape, a nice, sweet, sugary grape. But as part of that, before the seeds are viable, the vine will uh, essentially make the grape. The grapes will be small, green, sour, and bitter. And another part of that would be the flavor compounds, and it would taste like grass or bell pepper. Um, so that's a naturally occurring compound that, that the grape puts in to protect it, uh, the grapes when they're young. And then as they ripen and the seeds are uh, you know, ready to reproduce, uh, the vine will pump sugar into the grape to make it sweet and balance out the acidity. It will respirate some of the acid that's inside the grape, uh, and it will start to degrade some of those compounds. So, the pyrazine is always present and it's a classic note uh, for Cap Franc and especially Block 2 Cap Franc, which uh, has, you know, Clone 1 tends to be a little higher in pyrazine, a little lower than, uh, than some of the uh, other right char rightness characteristics. Um, and so I, I guess based on that vintage and its pick date, you know, uh, it's, it's a naturally occurring thing and it's stuck around. And I would say I don't find it to be. Uh, at a level where I find it offensive in any way. I think it's a nice, interesting compliment. And who knows, uh, pyrazine is a, you know, it's a broad category of, of aroma compounds. There's isobutyl, isomethyl, those are the two we really care about. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a, that could very well turn into that more dill note that I'm getting on the 2009. Uh, but if you can balance that with that fruit and that floral, then I, I, I find it attractive. It adds that interesting herbalness that, uh, that I was speaking about with the wine. And it's fun now that we have 2009 on the palette to circle back around, maybe compare it to the younger vintage. 
uh, just to see how much things change and how much stays the same. That's really what's remarkable to me. Not so much how the wine ages, but how the wine, the true character of the wine really, you know, is, is present even across decades. The major difference here is, uh, I think, the alcohol. You can really tell the difference between the 2009 and the 17. Um, you know, the 17 fills your mouth more. Alcohol is an interesting uh, thing to the palate. At you know about eight to I can't remember that upper end, but somewhere in the eight to 20 percent range uh, of alcohol, it actually provides a sweetness. Uh, and then beyond that, it's our main solvent uh, for extracting flavors from from the grapes. And so. The more alcohol you have, the more flavors you'll, uh, you're able to extract during the fermentation process. And then it also adds to that sweet character. So you, it kind of, the, the end result of that is that as the alcohol approaches that 14%, 14.5% even, you hopefully have a wine that you can't outright notice the alcohol in. Uh, but it seems like it's much more mouth filling and it carries a lot more of those riper, fruity flavors. Uh, whereas the more low alcohol wine tends to be a little bit more delicate, a little bit more on the herbal um, and dry uh, side of things. The other thing would be the tannins. Uh, you know, the, now circling back, it's always funny, the first wine you taste, you always think it's more the most bitter because your palate hasn't warmed up to tannins yet. But now I'm actually finding the tannin quality of the 2017 is right in line with the other ones. It's definitely, there's more of them, but it's actually, uh, not nearly as gritty and green uh, tannin as I initially uh, you know, had that impression of. And the way we accomplish that in the fermentation process is by incorporating oxygen. Um, so during the fermentation, we will do a punch down to mix the tanks uh, so we, the wine and the grapes can all live together. But another way that we'll do things is uh, with a pump over. Uh, and that can be as simple early in the process as hooking a hose up to the bottom of the tank and then gently using the hose and putting, you know, just wetting the cap. Uh, but as the fermentation's uh, really getting going, we'll actually hook, the, uh, we'll put a, a sump cart, it's a stainless steel box on wheels underneath the tank. We'll open the bottom valve and it'll just pour wine out in a violent eruption. And we'll pump out of that over the top uh, of the tank. And, you know, from five, six feet away, we'll just be pumping it as fast as we can and that really aerates. We even use something called a Venturi, uh, not a, it is an injector, but uh, it's a little fitting you can put on our hose that will allow us to constantly incorporate air uh, during that pump over process. So as we do that, and then also during rack and returns, which is the, when the wine's in barrel, we'll take it off any sediment and really start the clarification process. That's about to happen here in May. Uh, during that process, we have control over how much oxygen the wines get as well. So, in case we think the, the wines are still a little rough, we can uh, you know, let them pick up a little bit of oxygen on the, uh, on the rack of return as well. So, we don't want to eliminate tannins uh, during the winemaking process. We don't try to find tannins out. You know, you can put things in wine that strip the tannins to make it taste smoother. Uh, you can add things to try to round it out. Uh, really, what we want to do is tailor our tannins uh, until they're that more soft and supple, uh, but we still want them to, to be present. We still want a lot of them, and that really helps uh, enhance that mouthfeel, that big wine that, that fills up your whole wine. Ah, and uh, so if, if uh, these bottles weren't enough, I'm really excited to do these. I, I hope it, it provides that you guys uh, an opportunity to taste a wider variety of what we have here. Uh, but if you want to take another crack at it uh, or have more if you've found your favorite uh, or favorite two or three uh, you can still buy these online uh, as a three pack and we will have extended the uh, shipping deal uh, through the end of april uh, just use promo code spring on our website and uh, you can find all that information on crosskeysvineyards.com and our facebook page as well
and then so the 2013 is the one that's really catching my interest. Uh, I think it's found in a really nice place uh, as it ages uh, from the standpoint of the tannins are still more present than they were in the 2009. The nose is very interesting. It has enough fruit. It definitely has that, that herbal note or as one of the people joining us thought more of the, the pyrazine note. Um, but for me, that makes it nice and complex. It still has youthful acidity and plenty of tannins, um, but it, I think it makes it a more interesting wine. And this would be the wine where, I think it gets handed to be decanted, but this would be the wine where I would pour half a glass and sort of drink it slowly uh, as it warms up over the course of you know, 15 minutes. And really, you, I think there's a lot of depth to explore with that wine. Um, whereas, you know, with the 2009, there's a chance that after 15 minutes in the glass, uh, you'll really start to get less complex, kind of maintain one note. But the 13, I think it can still work really well with food. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting on its own, but uh, still has enough body left to it uh, to make it a nice compliment for, uh, for food. So far, thinking about aging potential, there's still another few years on the 13. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert on, on how long wine can age, but I think it's got at least two or three years before it gets anywhere close to, to 2009. Uh, the 2017, uh, we try to make the wines ready to drink now, and I think it is, uh, but uh, you know, it, you, like I said, we tailor those tannins to make the palate pleasant. But it's got so many in there that I think it can last, uh, you know, I think it won't have any trouble making it 11 years like the 2009 did. And the 2009 is still drinking wonderfully. Um, yeah, but at this stage with, a, with an 11 year old wine, you know, any day now, maybe it's, uh, it'll be time. So I would definitely say the 2009 is a, a drink now and maybe we're wrong and maybe in five years we'll still have some wine in the library and we'll still be aging. Uh, just fine, but uh, you, that's one of those that you should leave to us. That's a great resource we have with the library is that we're able to hold back these wines and taste them consistently and tell you when things are really you know, reaching their peak for tasting. I think 2009 is still at its peak, uh, and we'll see. It'll be exciting to know when that, when that drop off finally does occur, but it's a, a wonderful wine to enjoy on its own, uh, you know, or even with the, with the lighter fare. But yeah, I think if I was sitting down and you know, watching Tiger King for four hours, the 2009 would be my choice. If I was making some pasta, I think 2013, if I was grilling something or making barbecue, I think the 2017 would be a, would be a better, better option for it. Um, yeah, so with the next vintages of Cabernet Franc, I think the 2018, uh, as we move into the future, is gonna be uh, you know, it'll be an interesting wine. I think 2018 was a very challenging year from us, uh, for us as far as rain goes. Um, but it was also very humbling, not just because of the, the difficulty with rain, but we worked really hard to make good wines, and I think we accomplished that. I think all the wines are great. Uh, but when we sit down and taste them now, you know, especially against all these uh, older vintages, what we're finding is that they're more similar than we could have ever expected to the other wines. They're lower in alcohol, lighter in body, lower extraction, uh, just trying to you know, maintain the, the delicacy that we had in 2018. But the characteristic notes that we get over our vineyard seem to not care about the weather at all. So that's kind of, it's humbling for a winemaker to think that we have such an impact and we work so hard to do all these things to make a wine. Uh, but sometimes the vineyard, uh, the vineyard is the ultimate authority on the wine style. So, uh, you know, so all we can do is listen to what the vineyard is telling us and try to make wine around that. So hopefully we can refine that style. 2018 was a great, great time to do that. Uh, but another, it would be an interesting wine that doesn't have as much aging potential, but for the next four or five years, I think is, is gonna be a really nice complement to some of the bigger wines like the 2017 that we've made. And so next week, uh, since we, this was real popular, we don't wanna do the exact same thing, but I, I know some people didn't get a chance to join us uh, with these tasting bottles. But we have plenty more coming. Um, it will be limited because we will be doing a vertical of our Petit Verdot. And so I still haven't picked the library wines, 
I think we might look at the current vintage. I'm really happy with how he's drinking right now. And I'll go back into the library and find one that I think exemplifies what we do with Petit Verdot here very well. And then as an exciting touch, we will be cracking open, open the 2019 barrels uh, and sending out uh, samples of those as well. So you'll get a taste into the future. These are wines that are unfined, unfiltered, or well, we don't filter Petit Verdot anyways, but uh, totally you know, fresh out of the barrel. Um, you know, that we, have, we won't bottle for at least another four months, so it'll be an exciting way to, to see that. Do you recommend chilling any of these vintages to quote-unquote cave temperature prior to consumption? Um, like I said, if you wanted to get the full spectrum of the wine, it's great to get down to 55, 58, and then let it warm naturally. Um, I wish I had uh, more information for you on the ideal serving temperature, but that'd be something that would be interesting to, to get feedback from, from everybody with. Um, as it gets colder, you tend to get less of those fruit notes, so I think the 2017 might be very interesting uh, at a cellar temperature, cave temperature, um, because I think you'll get a little bit more of the, the herbal notes, which we know are there because we're finding them in the other two wines, uh, rather than just kind of that fruit bomb that we're getting it right now off of it. Um, that said, I think you might want to take some of them a little warmer, specifically the 2009 might be interesting to see as that gets warmer, um, if you can get a little bit, coax a little bit more fruit out of it. So like I said, it's, it's all about the spectrum of, uh, of the wine. And at some point in there, there's gonna be a, an ideal temperature where you like it the most. But I, I don't think that's a universal truth uh, as you do it. Is there a red in that group that you recommend for summertime? Of these three? Um, well, it depends on what you're doing for summertime. If you're, you know, if you're grilling burgers and uh, you forgot about them for a little bit and actually made hockey pucks, I think the 2017 would be perfect. That would be a wine that can stand up to some char. Uh, same thing, you know, it's, it's, all, it's more situationally. Um, I think, you know, if you were to chill the 13 a little bit down to that cave temperature and you know, enjoy it on a warmer day and let it as a warm up quickly. I think on a warm day, uh, I think it could be a, a wonderful wine on its own uh, or with food. Um, you know, the 2009, it's hard to call an 11 year old red wine a good summer wine, um, but who knows? I don't know. I haven't tried it. So maybe it goes perfectly with hot dogs and I'm just unaware. It's very, very well possible. So uh, I would say it depends on the situation, but uh, yeah, outside grilling with a slight chill on it. And the 17 would be perfect, uh, but you know, just hanging out outside on a nice spring day or you know, slightly cooler day, the 13 would be good too. And so, once again, please follow us on Facebook, visit our website, uh, look for the shipping deals, and we look forward to next week going vertical with the Petit Verdot. Um, I'm really excited to, to crack open a barrel and, and showcase finally the 2019 vintage that we're so, so excited about. Thank you guys for joining us, and look forward to seeing you next week.